All right. Well, we're going to be starting the seventh commandment today. We're finishing the last little bit of the sixth commandment. I have to say, when I was preparing this, I was just like, I'm so glad to be on the seventh commandment. It's such a walk in the park compared to the previous three. <laughs> nobody is really advocating in our world a lifestyle of stealing and, and screwing people over for their money. So, uh, so it should be a, a bit. Uh, although knowing this group, you guys are probably going to come with some really obscure and great questions uh, to draw out the discussion. Um, but that's okay. That's what I live for. So, all right, let's begin with the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessings that you have blessed us with in this life. Uh, the riches of relationships, the riches of material wealth, of shelter, of food, of well-being. Help us to honor you by being a good steward of those gifts and by helping others be good stewards of those gifts, all while trusting in your gracious provision. We ask your blessing upon our discussion in class today as we meditate on, on your law, and the seventh commandment, that it may be edifying and uplifting and encouraging to us as we go forth to live as your people and to serve in the mission of growing your kingdom. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so like I said, we're going to finish the very last bit of the sixth commandment, um, and we're going to start on page one hundred and one in your um, in your turn to page one hundred and one in your catechism. If you forgot your catechism, ask someone nicely if they can share with you, but don't get too close. <laughs> All right, on page one hundred and one. We're looking at question 75 and read there. And uh, we couldn't skip over the issue of pornography when we're talking about the sixth commandment because uh, it's become a major issue in our culture. What are some dangers or temptations that pornography poses today? So straight up, the very first sentence there is important to acknowledge. Pornography is a sin. Okay. And why is it a sin? It turns us away from God and from others. Because the internet has made pornography widely available, it has become an ensnaring addiction for many people. Now, I do want to acknowledge this point as well. Do you think that these current generations are more licentious and lustful than previous? No. 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 Right? Why might this be more of a problem than it used to be, at least pragmatically speaking? The availability, right? Like it takes a certain sort of gumption, maybe you've driven by an adult entertainment store or a strip club or a gentleman's club. Um, it takes a certain sort of gumption to be known to go to a place like that. Right? And you almost get the impression that like if you go there, it's just going to happen to be that somebody who knows you is going to be driving by when you're getting out of your car or uh, there's somebody's going to find out and then everybody's going to know right and so that um, what would that use of the law be that's preventing you from doing that that'd be the curve right because you're afraid of the consequences if somebody finds out right but now that it's available where you can do it behind closed doors in your own home and the risk is so low on that side of things or at least the perceived risk is so low that that is why it's become a more of an issue. It's not that um, you know particular generations are more lustful than others, right? Now we could say you could also make the argument that it's become much more of a feature of culture. Uh, so I don't know how in tune you are with recent news, but that was this has been kind of the subject of discussion about the Grammys because there was a certain performance of a certain song whose name and lyrics I will not utter here. Um, that was deemed to be pornographic by many people uh, and it's instead now celebrated by our culture so there is some of that as well okay <clears throat> so it is dangerous because a it turns us away from love for god and our neighbor towards sinful desires that are contrary to his will stimulating fantasies about sexual infidelity and adultery okay uh, so we talked about this a little bit where if somebody's lusting after a woman or a woman's lusting after a man, they don't actually desire them as a being, right? They're desiring them as an apparatus that's necessary to satisfy their own selfish desire. And right? so that's what this is talking about here. 
So our scripture reference here comes from Psalm 27. One thing I have asked of the Lord that the will that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his simple. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. So even when it comes to sexuality, what is our primary desire? God. To please God, right? <laughs> to obey God and to serve him and to glorify him by the way that we conduct ourselves in terms of sexuality. And pornography leads us away from that understanding. Okay. <clears throat> and then you've probably heard the first John 2 passage before. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desire of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So that might be a good question to ask yourself when you're curious about whether or not something is sinful. Is it a desire that comes from the Lord or does it come from the world? Right. And of course, we go to the scriptures to find that out. Letter B, it treats others, usually women, as physical objects for selfish pleasure, rather than as persons whom God has created to be his own and endowed with dignity and purpose. Okay. So not only is it a selfish, lustful desire, but you actually, in order to do it, you have to devalue the other person involved. They have to become something less than God intends them to be. So Matthew 5, 28, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Right. Um, and once again, that lustful intent is denigrating the man or the woman that you're looking at to just an object for your own selfish pleasure. Okay. And then Hebrews 13, 4 is another one of the passages there. Let marriage be held in honor among, oh wait, I didn't turn the right page. Although that is still good. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So that's once again emphasizing that your body and your life is not your own, which is uh, sort of now, ironically, directly antithetical to some of the chanting our culture does, which is my body, my choice. What I do with my body is no one else's business. The Bible says, sorry, not true. Your, your body is not your own. Right? You were bought with a price. Letter C, it undermines desire for a healthy, loving sexual expression between a husband and wife in marriage and leads to unrealistic views and sinful expectations about sexuality. So one of the things that I go over in a lot of my premarital counseling when we talk about this is this intent of uh, who sex is for. So the context of marriage, who is sex for? Couples. Married couples. But within that couple, who's it for? God. To glorify God. For each other, right? So to glorify God. And the way that you're going to glorify God in that context is by, like, using sexual desire and expression within the context of marriage between a husband and wife for the sake of the beloved. Right? So um, this is to counter what you'll often hear most of the time as a joke, but some people seriously talk about this, as withholding as a means of manipulation or power within the context of a relationship. Well, oh, so you didn't do the thing I asked you, so you're not getting any for two weeks or whatever. Right? The way they would express that in movies and TV. And the Bible says that's not the way it's intended to be used. Right? It's actually primarily for the sake of the beloved. And if both people have that understanding, it sort of works out, right? That you're not going to force somebody to have sex in the context of your marriage if they really don't want to. But at the same time, you're not going to withhold that gift and blessing from them for your own selfish desires, right? So it strikes a balance. And which is, which is like, it seems minor, but it's super important because if, if your sexual relationship in the context of your marriage becomes about power, then bad things happen. Right? And it's no longer an expression of love, but it's an expression of control and manipulation. 
Okay. Any questions about pornography in general? That's kind of the, the catechism, I think, does a pretty good job of summing that up. Okay. And I will say one of the principles behind recovering from this sort of thing, if this is a cross that you bear, is to let it out into the light. Okay. Now, don't do that irresponsibly because some people aren't equipped to help you walk through that and walk back from that. But it is important not to keep it to yourself. So find somebody trusted and somebody who shares your faith that you can bring into that trusted circle and assist you in repenting and turning away from that behavior. Okay. And it's important also to have a reminder, and this, is, this goes for sort of any addictive sinful behavior, that your perpetuation of this, despite your attempts to turn away, is not barring you from the forgiveness of Christ. Because those, those perpetual struggles have a tendency to do that. They have a tendency to create that thought in your mind that like, well, this isn't working. Christ can't love someone like me because I'm trying to do this, but I can't do it. Right? And of course, for us, that's the whole point of the fact that the gospel is something that God does to us. It's not something he enables us to do. Yeah, Russ. Yeah, and it's interesting because, um, and again, I don't want to prolong our discussion of the 16 anymore. <laughs> but, um, you know, in, in connection with the discussion about homosexuality, we talk about how that sort of sometimes in our culture feels like we create a hierarchy of sin. And I think similarly, this sin for the believer has the potential to do that. And you know, you don't want Bible study to be written in the headlines, but the Atlanta shooter apparently had mm. some significant difficulty in in controlling his um, practices of, of both pornography and going to prostitutes. And so, you know, he actually had, had made some statements to a friend about he felt like he was essentially unforgivable and that he had lost his salvation. So you know, that that despair, you know, it's, it's certainly, a, you know, when there's a sin that, that can lead someone to despair, it has the ability to just blot out everything else. Right. So, like, you could, the guy could have been maybe the worst liar in the world and had no conscience as to his lying because that particular sin, in his view, in his mind, was keeping him from, from God's law. Right. So, it's strange how certain sins have that sort of ability to, even in our own mind, Create a hierarchy there, which us right, right. And then what you end up to the point that was being made is that this is similar to our discussion about homosexuality, it has the potential, typically internally in this case, to become a sin that we somehow rank above others that makes us unworthy of God's love and, uh, and not worthy of his forgiveness. Now, he came out of a Southern Baptist background, I believe. We're talking about the uh, Atlanta shooter. Um, and like, in a, in a certain sense, that doesn't surprise me, right? Um, because anytime, whether it's after the fact or before the fact that you turn the gospel into any sort of law, in other words, anytime you attach conditions to it, whether it's a condition of you have to do this in order to be saved, or once you are saved, this is how you must behave, it leads to that sort of self-destructive thought. Because what happens if it's five years down the road and you haven't become a quote unquote better person as a Christian, right? If your faith is tied to your progression of being a better Christian over time, then you're going to start to have those sorts of thoughts and like, well, maybe I'm not loved by God because I'm not worthy of that love because look how terribly I struggle with this, even though I'm supposed to be saved, right? And that was the whole point of Luther pointing out in the scriptures. And really, and even before that, that's the point of why God made his plan of salvation totally separate from our behavior. And it's so bizarre to us because we want to attach them all the time, right? If not in our own life, in the lives of people we observe. Right? I want to be able to say, well, that person's not being a very good Christian. Why? Well, they don't look like it. Well, neither do you. <laughs> like if I had a little billboard that was on your forehead that showed me all the thoughts you're having day around, day around, we'd all be in big trouble, right? And so that that separation from the, your actions and their consequences and your salvation 
is almost like a constant struggle to maintain the belief in that because it's so antithetical to what we think as humans. Which for me is one of the strongest reasons as to why I can know it comes from God. Because no human being would ever treat other humans that way. You just don't. Yeah, well, yeah I guess I, that, that point I sometimes struggle with, meaning, um, I mean, what, what ought we to expect, right? I mean, there is some sense of maturity, spiritual growth, right? So how do we balance that out? Because clearly, I think that we all, I'm sure, carry certain things that we struggle with kind of day in, day out, and maybe others where we, we conquer them, right? And we say, okay, I put this away. Um, and it, it's, it is a tough topic because right now, of course, the culture, I mean, I read a, a story about, an article about this, this topic yesterday, and, and it's no surprise, you know, they, they want to attack Christianity, and, the, the, and it's amazing. They were, they were specifically calling out, like, this counseling center that he was, it was like a mile away from where one of these events happened, and they were sort of implying that because they were teaching that, that sex was for a man and a woman, and, and because they were teaching that, you know, what we were just talking about, that we shouldn't withhold from one another, but it sort of gets portrayed as like, oh, women are gonna get abused and we're teaching these unhealthy things. So anyway, it's probably a, a rabbit hole, but the, I guess the, my original thing was, uh, was really like, hey, how do we, how do we uh, take- and What, what should I expect yeah. after becoming a Christian? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a great question because um, I think one of the things we look scripturally is, you know, if we're not supposed to progress into being like better Christians in the sense of I'm going to sin less, I'm going to do better at this and that, you know, what should we expect from, there is some growth in faith. Well, notice what happens when you grow in faith. Like when you grow in faith, it's, it, I'm always reminded of the phrase of John the Baptist, that I become less so that he can become more. And so when you grow in faith, you're actually trying, you're clinging to the idea of that progress less and less, uh, which is sort of ironically what you need to do in order to avoid those pitfalls often. Um, and so one of the things that I think people don't often include is like part of your spiritual growth and maturity is just the fact that you are repenting of those sins and desiring to do better. Like that that interaction in and of itself is part of your spiritual maturity, a part of what the Holy Spirit within you means, because prior to the Holy Spirit being within you, you're not doing any of that, right? You may feel a, a sense of shame from the natural law sense of stuff, but you don't know what to do with that. And so usually it ends up going like Russ outlined for this guy, where you just heap that shame upon yourself and you try and bear it alone, and that doesn't work, right? Pete. I think on that same vein, I think on that same vein, um, as we become more mature in our Christian walk, we become hyper aware of how much we actually do sin. Mm -hmm. And yeah. sometimes that that makes the, 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 the more mature Christian doubt themselves because they are becoming so hyper aware of all the things that they're doing that they weren't aware of before. Well, and this, so the point that Pete made is that, like, when you become a Christian, you even become more hyper aware of your sin because you're seeing the law of God as it truly is for the first time, right? That we talked about that um, in the mirror usage, right? And Paul writes about that in a really sort of great and anguished fashion, where he's like, "I didn't even know what coveting was until you told me," right? Um, and then he has this big lamentation for almost a whole chapter of how. The stuff that he wants to do is the stuff he never ends up doing. And the stuff that he doesn't want to do is the stuff he always finds himself doing. And where, where does that leave him at the end of that, that sort of rant? What does he say? Who's going to rescue me from what? This body of death. And then he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Our Lord. Right? And I think that is actually the sign of a mature Christian. Ironically enough. right? It isn't that they are like figuring out this this sinful life thing and, and, and being able to like succeed in ways that non-Christians are. And that's usually people get into the comparison game, right? They'll say, well, I have non-Christian friends who are nicer than some of my Christian friends, right? And that misses the whole point. It's not about the externalities of behavior. Um, 
And like Lewis is, Lewis makes this point a lot of times where he says sort of the self-righteous, pious person is often further away from God than the prostitute, right? Because they've skipped past the concept of confession of their sin and their need of a savior. Uh, and they're using the judgments of God to judge others and not realizing that they're also judging themselves. Um, so yeah, I mean, and this goes along in general with one of the things that we're going to have to become more and more comfortable with, especially in our culture as it shifts, is being the other, being misunderstood constantly. That like, and not expecting ex like people who are not believers to understand at all any of the way we do things, right? Our desire is that they do come to that understanding, but our expectation as they are now I mean, I heard some clips of Don Lemon talking about Jesus in the last couple of days. Dude's totally clueless. Totally clueless. He misses like the whole point of the Christian faith. He says that God is, is not a God who would judge anything or anyone, which is totally dumb. That's like built into the job description of God. He's the only one who can do that, right? So it stands to reason that people who don't actually believe in God would know anything about it, right? And we have, in, in many ways, I would say, too often taken moral cues from non-believers in our in our society. And part of that is because it was it was much closely, much more closely tied together in the past. And so there wasn't as big of a division. But it's becoming, you know, to the point where when you have people who openly say they believe in God, yet actively push unrepentantly ideas that are antithetical to the scriptures. Like I cannot. I cannot state authoritatively the state of that person's soul, but I can say I'm no longer listening to them about morality. <laughs> um, so, like Joe Biden is a good example. I don't want to get too political here, but Joe Biden, I mean, this to me is an objective thing about Joe Biden. He says he's a Catholic and a practicing Catholic, yet he's actively pro abortion. So, you know, at the very least, he's a terrible Catholic in my mind. And so I can't say that he's not going to heaven, that he doesn't genuinely believe in Jesus, and that he's not just super muddled about stuff. But I can say I'm not going to really listen to him as a moral arbiter of the Christian faith, because he clearly doesn't know what he's talking about. Right? And you can see that all over the place. Okay, last thing, sixth commandment, before we move on to seventh. The, we had a question last week about legal divorce and marriage versus marriage and divorce in the church, which is a really good question, and I felt... Like my answer, while I felt the answer itself was correct, I didn't really like how vague my answer was. So I, I did some reading on that and asked some, some people wiser than I um, in the church uh, for their thoughts and had kind of discussed with them a bit. And I uh, wanted to tie in my answer, in, into my answer of that question, fourth commandment issues. All right, so there are fourth commandment issues and you can't totally disentangle marriage in the church from marriage because of that, that God has given the government the authority to carry out its laws as long as it's not going against God's authority. So obviously like the example of it, the government tried to start forcing me to do homosexual marriages in a legal sense. I have the prerogative to refuse that because they're stepping outside their God-given authority to do something against him, against things that he said. But if it doesn't fall into that category, as a Christian, I ought to obey those laws. So really the answer to that question is, it, I can't really conceive of a hypothetical situation where one, you're not being disingenuous on some level to your marriage vows because you say in your marriage vows for richer, for poorer, and better, or worse, or right? you're making an unconditional promise. So the particulars of, of health insurance and the burdens that that may or may not place on you in the future as well as like financial advantages you may get from separating. They don't really qualify uh, as a means of breaking that promise because it was built in, right? That that was, none of those things are conditions for that. Is it breaking up a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> it's battery low. I'm wondering if it needs to be it's, it's plugged in. Oh, no, the microphone itself might need to be battery low. Oh, that could be the case. Yeah. Um, well, if it gets bad enough, I'll just I'll just yell. Uh, okay. So the other aspect of that, as well, is is actually related to the seventh commandment, which is why this is kind of a nice transition. 
Um, I'm just going to go ahead and turn on. Uh, which is why this is a nice transition is that many of the cases by which you're using to justify your legal divorce, you're actually either gaming the system out of something that belongs to it or other people. So like if you're trying to get separate social security benefits, for example, or if you're trying to avoid a, a law that maybe you don't personally like, but isn't morally wrong, somebody's paying for that. And so in some way you are gaming the system and taking something either from the government that belongs to them or from taxpayers that belongs to them. And so, and I think in, I was talking to one of my buddies who his first career was a, was a lawyer before he became a pastor. And he was talking about Pennsylvania doesn't have legal separation. Uh, Nevada has that. Um, so unless you have legal separation, you can't even start that process without sort of declaring publicly that your marriage is irreparably broken. That's the legal, the legal definition of divorce. So it would be very difficult, probably impossible to separate that public confession about your relationship um, from, from people within the church. Right? And, and essentially you would be lying about the state of your relationship. So, Rob. This would be an appropriate place to bring in un unequally yoked and the freedom of the non-believer in this situation with the divorce and the responsibility of the believers. What do you mean? Well, uh, in a marriage that's unequally yoked, the non-believer can divorce like that with no problem. The are sure. non-believer anyhow. But many places in the Bible, uh, that believer has the responsibility of staying married, almost regardless. Okay. Yeah. So... Uh, and, and I did talk about this with the with my friends as well. That is is divorce still a sin for you if you're if you're the, one of the parties involved? Or you're really trying to make it work. You really want to salvage the relationship. You want to go to counseling. You want to do everything you can in order to salvage it. The other person just won't do it. They're not going to meet. They don't want to. They don't want to salvage the relationship, and they just want a divorce. Is it still a sin imputed on you if you get a divorce? And the answer would be yes. Because okay. divorce itself is a sin, regardless of intention. Okay, and then it's something that is like every other sin, repentant. Uh, and that's the point that Jesus makes when he talks to the Pharisees. He says Moses allowed for divorce because of your hardness of heart, but it was never something God wants. Well, how would right. it be repented upon if you've gotten a divorce? You go and. and from the Greek, metanoia means to change the mind, which means that the only way to repent would be to marry again, I would assume. So, no, so, no. so the, repent the repentance in that case would be, um, like repentance always deals with the intention of the sinful behavior in question. So like, even if you didn't want the divorce, you can't, like someone who's repentant though, can't say, this was a good idea. This was a good thing that happened. Right, because then you're viewing divorce not as a sin, but actually as a good thing in that case, where God is clear that it's never a good thing. And so the repentance in that case would be maybe you did get a divorce, and at the time you weren't particularly strong in your faith or, or knowledgeable about your faith, or maybe you weren't even a Christian at that point. And at the time you thought, this is a perfectly acceptable solution to the problem that I'm having. If your heart remains feeling that way about divorce, then you're unrepentant about your divorce. Whereas if you come to the understanding that this was a sin and God never wanted it, even if it's in the case that's justified in the scriptures of adultery and, and like chronic abuse and neglect, where it's, where it's like legally justified, it's still a sin in the eyes of God. It's still something that wasn't meant to happen. And so you have to, when you repent of it, you have to say, it is a sin. It shouldn't have happened. It did. And I lay myself at the mercy of God. Um, good question. That that sort of kind of tie up that that question. Any additional? That was a good question. And some of the particulars of it I had never really considered before. I've considered similar sorts of situations, but but not the exact one we talked about last year. And that abuse includes uh, mental and spiritual abuse. Yeah. And that work is very difficult. Yeah, and essentially, like we don't view marriage as a sacrament. So if, if the neglect and abuse in a marriage gets to the point where it's 
harming your faith in Christ, then it is a lesser of two evils decision, but it's not ever a good thing. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's why, like I, I say that divorce is always a sin regardless of intent. Um, so that it's not seen as, and these are the difficult issues, right? Where there's justifiable reasons in an earthly sense in a particular situation, but we never want to perpetuate the idea that that's an acceptable solution to marital issues. And so we deal with those as they come up. Somebody else, Ron, you raise your hand? So there's always forgiveness. Yep. And, and no matter, like if one person doesn't want to get a divorce, they don't want a divorce, but the other spouse does, we bicker back and forth, and finally the person relents and say, well, if you want a divorce, go ahead and do it. And the person doesn't want it, but even if they do, they can still go to God and lay myself down. I'm sorry for what I've done. Mm -hmm. But there's forgiveness in you, no matter what we do. Right? Yeah. The only way there's not forgiveness is if you reject the forgiveness. And the way you reject the forgiveness is by viewing the thing that you ought to, to repent of as something you don't need to repent of. Right? So that's the difference between the repentance or unrepentant. It's the same with the other issues we've talked about, like homosexuality or transsexuality, right? If somebody can live their most of their life as a transsexual, come to faith in Christ at the age of 70, and turn away from that and repent of that, and it's, it's forgiven. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, that's the only reason, really, that we're concerned about people's behavior and the way they live their lives, is we're trying to point them to what God says is good for them in order so that they avoid the fate that we all deserve by the rejection of Christ, the forgiveness given to them in Christ. Mm -hmm. It's hard to come up with a good image for it. The best I can think of is, like, we are drowning a lake. We're flailing about. Okay. And every day of our life, God is reaching out to us. And Jesus reaching out, reaching out, reaching out. So it's not a question of is God loving? Is God reaching out? That's that's true. That's that's true. As a, we, we believe that when Christ died, he didn't just die for like his apostles, he died for everyone. Um, so when someone comes to faith. The forgiveness one on the cross is theirs in Jesus. Okay. Um, the only unforgivable sin is like the habitual and consistent slapping away of Jesus' aid. I don't know why he allows us to do that, but the scriptures are clear that he does. So that's a possibility. Christ say you can deny me, but the only unforgivable sin is denying the Holy Spirit. Yes. So the Holy Spirit, what is the Holy Spirit's job? Bring you to Christ to bring you well, the the kind of fun definition I learned in confirmation is the Holy Spirit's job is to bring us the Jesus stuff. Right. So the the in that image, the reaching out of Jesus is the work of the Holy Spirit. Right. How does God reach out to you? Reach out to you to the Word and through His gifts and the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Right? And so the rejection of the Holy Spirit is the rejection of God reaching out through Jesus by means of the Holy Spirit. And for whatever reason, he's allowed us to do that. And there are Christian, there are large Christian denominations that don't think we are able to. And so they'll say, like, if you fall away from faith, you never had faith to begin with. Because once you have faith, you can't, you can't turn away from it. Okay. <coughs> Seventh commandment. Okay, this is on page 105 in your small catechism, Seventh Commandments. We're going to turn to page 105. This was the hardest one to memorize in catechism class. <laughs> Anybody got it? Did they can read it without looking at their book? <laughs> Don't everybody jump up. Oh, you shall not steal. Oh, Jack, it's the gold star for the day. You shall not steal. Very good. Very good. Shall I nail it to her forehead? <laughs> <laughs> what does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not take our neighbor's money or possessions or get them in any dishonest way, but help them to improve and protect his possessions and income. So right off the bat, what is this verse talking about in particular? Don't take none that's not yours. Huh? <laughs> Don't take none that's not yours. <laughs> yeah. What is the, the stuff you're not supposed to take? Is it reputation? 
Is it integrity? Stuff, money. Stuff, right? So this is intentionally focusing on material blessings. Right? We're not even allowed the desire to have the other person. We'll get there. Okay. <laughs> those That's are, not a commandment. Those are, those are, those, we're getting to those commandments later on. All right, so open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. We're going to go verses 1 through 10. Do you have another sheet? Just huh? Do you have another sheet? Extra sheet? Oh, yeah. I'm always late. And I'm prepared. <laughs> I'm sorry. My mind is too heavy to carry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. you can always keep it in your phone. So you may be familiar with this story. You may even know the song that goes with it. The kiss was a wee little bed. A wee little bed was he. Yeah. Sick Lord, Chief. Lord, he wanted to see. You went to VBS. <laughs> I did. For Sunday, for Sunday school. What did I do? I did. All right. So I'm just going to read through this and follow along the first 10 verses. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And we just when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. You can imagine that. I always thought about that, where it's like, I just want to see this guy. And then all of a sudden, somebody I've never met is calling me by name in this big crowd of people. He's probably like, I'm wishing I didn't climb up the tree. <laughs> so he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. When they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this, this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So what changes did Jesus bring about in Zacchaeus? If he was rich, um, what that meant as a tax collector was if the government said, hey, we need to take three shekels from you, and he goes, hey, I need five shekels from the government, he gets two shekels for himself. Right. So if the tax collector rich, he was stealing from everyone. Right. All right. So we know that everybody, and was this like a secret or did everybody know it? Yeah, everybody knew it because as soon as Jesus starts talking to this guy, they're like, is Jesus a moron? Why is he talking to that guy? He's a horrible person. He's a sinner. Why would Jesus talk to sinners? I'm glad he does. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what change did he bring about in Zacchaeus? And Zacchaeus was a dishonest tax collector who lined his own pockets with other people's money. What is, does he stay a dishonest tax collector? No. no. Right? What does he say to Jesus? Give half of what he has, and then on top of that, yeah. If I have defrauded anyone, I will restore what I've taken from them for full. Right? Uh, and so he's turning away from his, his sin, right? So we can talk about that in the context of the growth question before, right? Is Zacchaeus growing in his faith here or no? Yeah, right? And he's growing by thinking of himself less. Right? Um, and so, does that mean that uh, Zacchaeus never stole anything for the rest of his life? No, it doesn't, right? But it does mean that the intent of his heart had been changed to not do those things. So in the event that maybe he did, he wouldn't take as much. Similar to this. <laughs> <laughs> See, bro, I only took three points instead of seven. No, uh, no so he... So he would, like we do, when we sin, <laughs> he would, he would, uh, children, come on. All right. He would um, do the same process that we just saw with Jesus. He would turn away from that and the different. Right? 
Um, and in the sinful world, that's like a constant daily process that's never finished. Right? So that's what I mean when I say it's not like a stair-step progression. So you ought not to expect this side of heaven that you're going to be way better at reading your Bible in five years than you are now. Or that you're going to be way better at you know, responding well in spite of difficult situations better in five years than you are now. What you can't expect is that any time you do that, when you succeed, you're not boasting yourself, but you're thankful that the Lord gave you the words to speak and gave you the ability to resist the temptation or whatever it is. And when you fail, you also then turn to the Lord and you turn to him and confess that sin and appeal to his mercy in Jesus. That's, that's the Christian life. All right, what are some of the ways that I can help to protect and care for the earthly goods of my neighbor? So, as we learned, right, every commandment has prohibitions, things you're not supposed to do. But we also learned that you're not just, you're not necessarily keeping the seventh commandment just because you're not stealing from other people. There's a positive encouragement or exhortation aspect as well. So what are some of the ways I can help protect and care for the earthly goods of my neighbor? It was just a oh. oh well if you think that somebody's being scammed you mm -hmm. can let them know that you know hey you gotta watch this. right very good right so you pick up on something that somebody is being taken advantage of and you're called as a as a christian in obedience to god's law to make them aware of that right and if i don't even though i'm not the one stealing from them i'm in violation of the seventh commandment mm -hmm. There's just an example this morning of some people found, um, you know, a person's earring on the floor and then brought it to, to my attention. I announced it to the church and they were restored back to, to what they had. Yeah, very good, right? So when something is is gone missing in, in the church somewhere, we don't know, it's like, well, good luck in finding it. See you later. <laughs> this is the sort of place where where we want to protect and, and encourage uh, the blessings and, and, and help maintain the blessings of one another. And what's really at the heart of this commandment? When you violate this commandment, what are you not doing? So if I'm in the if I steal something, what am I not doing? I think you're saying you can't trust God to provide it for you. Very good. You're not trusting in God's provision for you. Right? You're saying, like, well, maybe he has plans for me to have this in five years, but I want it now. So I'm going to do it. Um, and you may justify it through all manner of reasons, right? It could be like, well, this is a faceless corporation and they have millions and millions of dollars, so it doesn't matter if I steal $100,000 from them. Wrong, right? Yeah. For the simple example right here, and I think a lot of people may be falling um, to this in work situations, is um, stealing a pen, right? Mm -hmm. Or stealing, like, you know, a pack of post bits. We don't often think of it as stealing, you know, when we're in a work situation. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, it's just like, you know, how much could it possibly cost them for a pack of post bits? Right. Right. But that's still stealing. Right. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, like I had, I had a time where I went to uh, a Walgreens and I was getting a couple of things. And one of the things I got was, was chapstick. And for whatever reason, I had put the chapstick in my pocket and I'd forgotten about it. And the thing didn't go off when I walked out of the, the store. But then I like took it out to put it on. And I was like, wait a minute. I don't, I don't think I paid for it. <laughs> and I had gotten away with it. I was out in the parking lot. I was in my car getting ready to drive away. So I went back inside and said, hey, I had this in my pocket. For whatever reason, I was able to walk out of the store without paying for it. Then I paid for it. And the person behind the counter was like, kind of weirded out. <laughs> because it's like, not only did you get away with it, but it's like 99 cents. Dude. But, but that is, you know, brought up all kinds of memories of me having to apologize to people as a kid. My dad's standing right behind me. <laughs> all right. Are earthly goods important? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. What are some of the reasons why earthly goods are important? Live. Your oh, you didn't pay, so you need them, mm -hmm. right? Your house. What what else <laughs> gives them importance? They're all provided by God. Yeah, they all come from God, right? And so the, the orientation of this commandment is helping us realize that not only the stuff that we have, but the stuff that other people have have been given to them by God. 
which means I have no right to transfer those things over unless they're given voluntarily. Continue. Right? Maybe that's the purpose for which God gave it to them, is to give it to me. But I can't expect or demand that of them. Right? Or, in this case, try and take it from them. So, um, let's see. The bottom of page 105 here. They are blank by which God provides our blank and our blank needs and the enjoyment of life. So they are gifts. So if something's a gift, what does that auto automatically mean about it? It's free. It's free and it wasn't ours to begin with. You didn't earn it, right? And this applies to your paycheck at work, by the way. It's a gift from God. You might, you might be like, well, wait, I did a bunch of work to earn that. <laughs> yeah, but you can't escape it because all the abilities and talents and ways in which you are able to do that work were given to you. So by extension, your paycheck is a gift as a result of all those things. Which he provides for our own and our neighbor's needs and the enjoyment of life. Part of God's creation is that it was good and that he enjoyed that it was good. And he wants it to be a place that his creatures actually want to be, right? So this is where we would disagree with like super pious Puritanism, right? Uh, going to a wedding at a Southern Baptist church is like one of the most boring things ever because you can't drink or dance, right? And it's that way because some people have abused those blessings and made them sinful. And so the answer was, well, let's just cut that out all together because we can't handle the temptation, whatever the argument is, right? But God intended those things to be a blessing when they're used in the proper context. I could make my shoe something that people don't want me to have if I walk around hitting people with it all the time. That doesn't mean <laughs> shoes are bad and shouldn't be used, right? And so God intends these things, these blessings, to be something that help us enjoy life um, within, of course, the proper context. So Psalm 104, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. Right? So it's not just for necessity, but also joy. And that's important to realize. Okay. So we keep this commandment by not doing the following. Stealing our neighbor's blank and blank. Money. One of them is money. What's the other one? Possessions, right? So not just their money, but like you can't steal your neighbor's tricycle either. Right? Or their car. Or their lawnmower. Judas we'll we'll said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag he used to help himself to what was put into. We know the context of that passage. That's right after a woman wastes in Judas's mind a super expensive perfume by rubbing it on Jesus' feet. And what does Jesus say about the poor? You're always going to have the poor. You're not always going to have the It's just preparing to be a burial. All right. Second one. Being blank or blank when working as employees. What are you getting paid for a lot of times when you're working? How do they calculate your paycheck? Huh? By hour, By hour right? By time. So if you're being lazy or sloppy, what are you doing from your employer? Stealing. You're stealing. You're stealing. You should have seen the faces of my seventh and eighth graders when I said that to them. You're like, what? Like they just never connected us. Ephesians 4, 28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Okay. 
right. Acquiring goods by blank, fraud, or taking blank of others. Dishonesty, fraud, or taking advantage, advantage of others. So this is like the example that, that Glenna has. You see somebody being scammed. What is the scammer doing? They're taking advantage of somebody, right? So why is it that, that uh, email scams and phone scams primarily target elderly people? Because they're easy to take advantage of. They're easy to take advantage of, right? Um, and not just them. I'm, I've almost gotten, gotten uh, scammed a few times myself, and yet they're pretty clever sometimes. Right. Um, so if we're doing any of that, and this includes, by the way, like in the context of kids, if one of your sons is trying to convince your other son, hey, you know, this thing is actually not that great. You should have this thing instead. <laughs> you know, that they're basically handing them a piece of trash or something worth a lot more. And they're taking advantage of maybe their younger brother and his lack of knowledge about certain things. Right. Um, so that's an excellent opportunity to talk about the seventh commandment. Okay, not saying that I did that myself. <laughs> All right, we keep this commandment by doing. So the first section was by not doing things, but by doing the following. Protecting and improving my neighbor's blank possessions. Earthly possessions, very good. If a man borrows anything, this is Exodus 22, 14. Anything of his neighbor and it is injured or dies, the owner not being with it, he shall make full restitution. Protecting and improving my neighbor's blank and blank. Their income and their livelihood. Let each of you, this is Philippians 2.4, Look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. In Exodus 23, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. So, in other words, I don't like that person or they're mean to me. It's not a justification to do bad things to them. What are things considered possessions today that we might not realize are possessions? So typically when you think of possessions, what do you think of? Huh? Material things. Yeah, like action figures, lawnmowers, and, and automobiles, and houses, and things like that, right? What are some other things that are actual possessions that want people that might not realize are possessions? Netflix is count. Huh? The Netflix account that you uh, <laughs> okay. log into without them knowing. Yeah. Oh. Pirating somebody's <laughs> streaming account. I said reputation. Reputation? Mm -hmm. um, sort of, but that's getting covered by commandment number eight. What about their intellectual property? Mm -hmm. And so if your neighbor has a really great idea, and you're like, oh, I like that idea. And then you steal it and use it for yourself and make a patent on it. <laughs> you stole from them. But just to be clear, we're only talking about economic ideas here. Because I mean, wisdom, right? If your neighbor has a good idea in terms of a word of truth or something like that, it's not Yeah, economic. well, in that case, it wouldn't be stealing. Yeah. Right? Wisdom is not something it, like held. Unless you took credit as your own. I think that comes down to where your heart lies. So if you pass it off as your own wisdom, like that you came up with, then it would, you know, I think it would have some overlap with intellectual property. This is primarily referring to something that would be economic. Because um, there's a saying in the educational world, teachers are the best thieves. Because we see good ideas and we use them in our own classroom. But it's, it's community property at that point. Yeah. You want to know one that makes, uh, at least it made the junior high kids in my class their eyes bug out? So I said, like movies. If you watch a movie online illegally, you're stealing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they, it's so common 
But they were like, what? Really? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Those monies, those movies take a lot of money to make. Mm -hmm. and in order to make back what they spent, they sell the movie. Right? And so do you think the movie is good enough to buy? You buy it. And that's how they, they pay the people who worked on the movie and they make more movies. If everybody just started legally streaming bootleg copies of the movies or stolen copies of the movies, pretty soon you have no movies because nobody's making any money from them because you're stealing all of their, their revenue. I can, I can share a story that's uh, funny now, but when I, when I was in college, um, it was right after like all the, uh, what, what was it? MP3. Napster, Napster and stuff where people were sharing music and it's the same kind of thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. MP3 files were new and so, you know, people would have these huge collections, and and I I got snagged in it. There was one time where I decided to share it. I'm like, oh, I'm going to share like a particular song with a friend, and it happened to be the time when they did a random scan of, of the entire college network. <laughs> oh, and so I ended up in the in the classroom with like 300 kids. You know, we had to go and explain, yeah, write like a paper on, you know, intellectual property and like why this is wrong. Oh. Uh, it is, I mean, it's a, it, it is a significant thing, like it, because we don't want to be so casual, right, where we think right. that, um, you know, whether you, you think you're going to get caught or not, you know, it is, it, it is important, especially digital, right? Because how do you know? You know, you could, right. you could have a million people playing a song or playing a game, but if only, you know, 10% of them are, are buying it, then it's right. not good. Right, right. Yeah, I think I had, I had a friend in college who was, was doing the BitTorrent thing with movies, which is meant as a program that's meant to make it hard to track by like basically breaking apart all the files into little tiny pieces and then reassembling them so they're really hard to track. And one of them, I think what they started doing for a while is they would pick a random person and make like a big lawsuit threat so that they would tell all of their friends and people would realize that like, it's not a totally risk averse thing to do this. Because it was something like she got an email or a phone call from a company that said, like, we know you've been downloading illegal movies and if you don't stop, we can, we have the possibility of suing you up for like a quarter of a million dollars for property damage. You know? So <laughs> they pretty quickly stopped doing that. Um, because they were college students, so they didn't have a quarter million dollars. But yeah. I have one. Yeah. I have one. Well, in the Navy, at least for us, we call it Calm Shaw. And, and, you know, it never leaves the Department of the Navy, but still, we, we trade coffee for something. But it was really, it was illegal when actually the, the submarine base on Hawaii under Nimitz was basically built on Calm Shaw material. Yeah. You know, all the, you know, these chiefs, they got the wood and, but yeah, oh, okay. we just justify it saying, well, it's all the navies anyway, you know. Gotcha. Yeah. And it can get it can get to the point like it did with music yeah. and movies where it almost feels like you're not doing anything wrong because everybody like so many people you know are doing it. Also, it real quick, right. another thing too, we'd be there about, you know, when the stuff would come on board uh -huh. and us seamen or whatever, when the stakes would come in, one would go over here, one would go <laughs> out there. So we, it was fun, but you knew it was wrong. Uh -huh. We ate good. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how those two things go together sometimes. Yeah. It, was, it wasn't right, but it was fun. <laughs> okay. Well, if it wasn't fun, I don't think a lot of people would be done. Well, yeah. <laughs> All right, so we actually already did talk about this. What are some examples of using the seventh commandment as a curve and a mirror and a guide, right? Um, we're all pretty familiar with those three terms now. Right? The curve would be like, hey, we're going to sue you for a quarter of a million dollars if you don't stop doing this. And then you're not really stopping it out of the, the moral righteousness within you. You're stopping it because you don't want to get sued for a quarter of a million dollars. And that's a curve. The mirror is maybe you're like my junior high kids and had no idea that that was related to stealing. And all of a sudden now the law of God made that known to you and then you cease to do it because it's raised it up in front of you. You're like, oh man, I didn't know I was doing that. Um, or maybe you did it again and the law comes up in front of you and shows you again, but that's, you know, sorry, this week it's still not correct. Um, and then a guide would be the desire now having that truth been revealed to you that this is the way I ought to do things because it's the right thing. 
not just because I'm afraid of consonants. Okay, the last thing I want to point out about the seventh commandment, because um, we're we're right at about an hour here, is um, I want to encourage you to think about this is probably one of the easiest ones to just put in legalistic terms, right? Because it's just don't steal. Um, but I I want to encourage you to think of it in the larger context of God's provision, which has come up a couple of times, right? uh, and really. We, and we talked about this early on. If you're breaking the seventh commandment, what commandment are you also breaking? The first. The first right? Because as Bob pointed out, if you're stealing from somebody or something, you are not trusting in the provision that God has provided you. Right? And so, in other words, in that moment, you're acting like your own little God. You're saying, I know better. I'm going to take this. I don't know what you're thinking about or the timeline you have, but it's clearly not correct because I need this right now. So I'm going to take it. Okay. The other thing that related to God's provision that's going on there is you're also not trusting his provision for other people. All right. So think of some of the arguments we hear about rich people. Like, well, they shouldn't have their money. Why? Well, because I want it. Well, that's a terrible reason. Right? Um, now, in the instance in our in our scripture reading from Luke 19, we could say that about Zacchaeus, right? He shouldn't have had that money. Not because he was rich, but because of the way that he got. Right? Um, and so one of the arguments you see back and forth all the time in our current culture is everybody says, well, we should just tax the wazoo out of all the really rich people and pay for all this stuff, not knowing that a lot of those rich people are already contributing a ton of money to charity as well as providing most of the resources that create new jobs right so it is so it's not as black and white does that mean that there aren't rich people who haven't gained their their riches by ill-gotten gains no. no of course not right but they're not all evil like all poor people are poor because of things that are all beyond their control some people have made bad choices other people have just found themselves in terrible situations by means which they could not control. Right? And so you have to take those things on a case-by-case -case basis. Right? And the way that we do that as Christians is we recognize that not only is what we have from God's provision, but what they have is from God's provision. Right? So maybe the reason that that person has lots of money is they're going to be better than me at using it in the proper way. Right? I don't even know what I would do if I made as much money as like a baseball player. So, plus the majority of those people that appear rich are small business owners and the vast majority of their rich is going to pay for the operation of the company and their employees sure. they're not rich right which is why the, the the important assumption that we have to operate from is like until proven otherwise like in the case of Zacchaeus it becomes known to Jesus you got these things in ways that you shouldn't. Then we trust that the reason they have what they have is it was given them by God. Right? Like, that's not really my business. Whether it's what I have currently or what they have currently. And then if they, you know, if they're called on to, because like some of the most generous people I've encountered in, in the context of church life are also wealthy. And most of the time, people have no idea. We had a couple of, at my previous congregation that because of, of his business savvy and the way that he lives his life and helped handled his money, his, he and his wife were able to, at the end of the year, ask the, the congregational president or the pastor and say, how much are we short of the budget? And then just write a check. I can't do that. And if I had that much money, I don't know if I would do that. Right? So it's not as, as black, white, and cut and dry, but that's why I want to think about it in the context of God's provision is one, then you're not bitter about what he gives other people, and you're not bitter about what he's given you. Okay. And it is kind of funny, right? Because, like, you know, I'm still kind of coming out of the poor grad student aspect of paying back student loans. <laughs> and I'm a little better than I was when I first started as a pastor, but, like, there have been times where I've been worried about making ends meet because something breaks in my house or my car. And all of a sudden, my savings doesn't look so great, right? And then I'm worried and anxious about, about you know, what God going to provide me? But that's a 
And I'm anxious about that every time, despite the fact that he always has, which is so weird to me when I think about it. It's like, it'd be like constantly second guessing your friend who's always told you the truth about whether or not he's lying to you. And I don't do it there. I typically assume, oh, this person's never lied to me, so they're not lying right now. But with God, for some reason, you know, that's that's that spiritual work. Yeah, Russ. You said really, um, really like combining the seventh commandment and the first because it sort of reminds me of the gospel lesson today where you know Jesus says this is how the seculars view authority, but this isn't how it's going to be with you. Everybody has to have possessions and a relationship to money, but by combining these two, it does two things. It sort of changes the way we think about other people's possessions, but also about our own, right? Because when you start to think of that as a gift that's ordained by God and part of his daily provision for us, we can sort of esteem others' possessions, you know, like more in violent, in more in violent sense, but also kind of in a looser sense for our own because God provides for us. Right. Right. Yeah, Paul talked about that we learn to be content in abundance or in need, right? In that when you get to this place where you're viewing everything that you have, regardless of how much it is, as a gift. Then that you are less likely to fall prey to ideologies that would say, well, I don't have and this person has, which by definition means they're bad and, and I need to have something. Or, or vice versa, right? That, well, God has given me all this and he hasn't given any of that to you, so that must mean that you've done something wrong. That's not necessarily true. So, um, all right, last thought, let me do this. One of the things uh, when I read the Bible that, that I get ashamed of myself for is, um, Jesus is saying, look at the birds and look at the animals. They're taken care of. They go, you know, uh, they don't want for anything. They're fed, they're housed. He goes, how much more will I take care of you? And when I'm in a situation where I'm worrying about things, and, and like you said, with your car and whatnot, I go to that, that passage, I'm just like, okay, why can't I trust? You know, I trust. Help me with my untrust, you know. Um, and, well, and, and that, that verse in particular is not referring to instances of worry, right? It's, it's referring to like a chronic state of worry. So some people are really harsh on themselves in regards to worry. And, and there, in a certain sense, it's okay to do that because you want to dissuade yourself from remaining in that. But that the purpose of that passage isn't really to say like, never worry ever again. It's saying, if you are worrying, don't remain in your worry because. So it's again, a perpetual state of the heart is being discussed there um, because like Ron was expressing it when we were talking about lusting after a beautiful woman that's a part of your brain that just <laughs> does stuff and you can't turn it off right it's the same with worry like nobody told me I had to worry about something it just starts happening and then I realize when I by the time I realize it it's already there and so what we're then called to do is I'm worried and I need to take that worry to Jesus Trust in his people. Pastor, I wasn't talking about me. I was talking about all these other guys. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 We knew that. <laughs> all right. On that note, we're going to close. We'll close with the word of prayer. Um, and next week, we'll be getting into the eighth commandment. Um, so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the material earthly blessings that you've given us, both for our needs, but also so that we may enjoy life in your creation. We ask that you help us to learn continually to be content with what you have given us, whether you have given us a lot or not a lot. Knowing that all those things are a gift, help us also to be content with what you have given others and endeavor to help protect and preserve what they have in order to serve you. Be with us this week. Help us to carry out what you have taught us in your word today in church and through our study of the scriptures so that we may do the work of the kingdom in service to you and in service to those who place in our lives. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, guys.